Pascal with a king on the button. To Mark and Philippe behind. Is going to raise the minimum. Felipe with a nice hand here in the big blind. Only s about 16 big blinds, though. That was surely, uh, for a minimum raise, just too good a price. Seven high to be, with seven six suited, pardon me, to be folding. Right. And he looks like he's going to make the call here. Is one of the shorter stacks at the table. Curious to see what he does on a seven high or six high board type situation. So we get a flush draw <laughs> instead. And this is a pretty good one from as well, right? Because Pascal is just going to see about this board with a really high frequency. Right. You would imagine Pascal is probably opening the button quite wide and it's going to bet this board at a pretty high frequency. So. Does bet 14 million. Course, can get reasonably small because a lot of time Philippe just has hands that can't continue. Right, like if this was seven six of hearts, just be in the muck already. <coughs> we'll see if Philippe wants to just go all in here. It does just cool because it's just more sizing. But man, being a short stack with a range disadvantage just sucks, and that is the spot that Felipe Oliveira finds himself in on this flop. This flop is all over Pascal's range, right? I mean, he's supposed to have all of the big hands, whereas Felipe, with 16 blinds to start the hand, can't really rep too much on this board if he wants to check raise the flush draw, right? Um, for sure, that's true. When we say it's all over Pascal's range, though, it's important to remember Pascal is the big chip leader here. We're five left. The money jumps are significant now. And his range is pretty darn wide. So while this hits, he's got all the strong hands. He also has a million weak hands, we would assume anyway. And that he's going to bet all of them on this flop. So he has a huge amount of misses here too. He does. So let's talk about the pros and cons of check raising this flop as Felipe. And I want to start with the cons because as we see, he did call. So these are in favor of Felipe's decision here. And the biggest con right now is that the story is bad. Like I said, Felipe doesn't really have many big hands on this flop. He's going to shove ace-jack preflop, almost certainly. He's probably shoving ace-five preflop. That leaves him with mostly flush draws as his check shoves on this flop and maybe some jack-five suited. Yeah, he might have some other aces that he doesn't raise preflop with. I know he's got 16 blinds. Traditionally, we'll see that play. and I, I, I would expect him to make that play at least a fair amount of the time, but probably not all the time. Probably once in a while, especially when it's a min raise, he'll defend with an ace once in a while uh, to protect himself, you know, to protect his calling range there and things like that. And then he could be uh, raising with that hand too, and that's a reasonable hand to raise with. I kind of disagree with that being an, uh, a hand that you want to raise. I mean, if you get an ace high flop and you have defended with an ace when your opponent doesn't expect you to have defended with an ace they have a range advantage and they're the guy who's the chip leader who's going to take a bunch of shots i would much rather check call with an ace and let the guy do the blast off for me and let pascal do all the betting it all depends on who your opponent is right so mark mcdonald's at the table now if mark mcdonald was was the button he was the big chip leader he'd be a great guy to check raise a bad ace against or an ace against because he's a guy who He's going to put together that this is not a great story. We don't have much value and call with a wide range of hands that are, you know, wide, wide range of one pair of hands and maybe even some king highs and things like that. Um, but if your opponent is much more straightforward, then, then I agree with you for sure. Yeah, and we don't really know enough about Pascal to know, but I also do know there are some pros to check raising here. Like, well, we get to win the pot sometimes with seven high instead of having to improve. Wouldn't that be nice? I mean, that's a really big deal. The pot is already significant to us right now, right? There's like seven blinds in there or something. Like, holy moly, six and a half blinds, something like that. We don't have very many chips. Like, wow, that would be great. The other really good thing about raising right now, we're raising, of course, with the intention of never folding. We would raise to a point where we would commit our stack. Yeah. Um, at least mentally, we would know we weren't, if we get moved in on, in this case, we would, we would successfully get a fold. But if we were moved down, we of course would call. So we'd raise an amount that mathematically would be forced to do that. Uh, that means that if we were to hit our flush, we would actually get a full double and we'd suddenly be back in this game a bit more, right? We'd, we'd suddenly have a, a bit more of a fighting chance. One of the problems with check calling is that if we hit our clubs, it's sometimes hard to get the double, 
You know, like maybe, maybe Pascal is going to barrel away and rep the clubs and we get the double anyway. But if he has anything, he may be pretty afraid of the club because what did we just check call with? It's hard to come up with too many hands besides a jack. A jack right. is a hand we could check call with. Besides that, there's not much. Ultimately, it all comes down to what we think of Pascal because the most important element here is if we have fold equity or not. If we have enough yeah. fold equity, check raising is clearly the better play. But if we don't, it's clearly not. So if Pascal's the guy who's opening all of the buttons because he's the chip leader and he's opening literally like 99% of combos, then we should absolutely check raise. But if he's not, he's still playing a little snug, even with the chip lead. We should probably check call because the story is kind of garbage. Agreed. It's, uh, I would guess, though, that he's probably playing a bit wider than a normal button because he's got the big chip lead, I would guess. And he's always betting this board, of course, unless he has a jack in his hand exactly. So it just seems, or maybe kings and queens, uh, it just seems like a pretty good spot to raise. Yeah, I think I would, I would default towards raising, even though the story's bad. If you want your opportunity to check raise, maybe you should try it on Nitrogen Sports Poker. Jonathan, tell them all about it. Well, it's an incredible spot for everyone, people. There's our Poker Guys monthly tournament where they guarantee a 1,000 buy-ins. We usually get like 150, 180 people. They cap it at 300, meaning there's always a massive overlay. It's incredible. They also have industry standard leading cash outs at 90 minutes or less. No one does that. Well, it's 90 minutes anyway. I don't know if it's less than 90 minutes, but still 90 minutes. Uh, also, they have sports betting casino games. Get in there, get you some poker. It rocks. We'll see. Doesn't mean he can't bluff the river, right? If this goes check, check on the turn, then he could still represent some strong hands on the right. river. Obviously, he doesn't have the strongest aces pre-flop, so. Both approaches definitely viable. I think you definitely want to have some flush draws in your check call range, so this is not a bad one to have. And he turns an open ender here, too. But it does give Pascal a pair, so he's right. going to check back. And river can be very interesting. Queen on the end. Now, Philippe has some hands like King-10, I guess, Queen-10. Uh, it's it's pretty hard for Philippe to be bluffing here. It's basically right. just missed flush draws at this point. Something and, easy. yeah. You would think maybe a lot of those flush draws might check shove on the flop, too. So if he, Philippe bets here... Right, it's just his sizing is whether... It, does he want to make it like he could be value betting a hand as weak as a queen, or is it... Does he go slightly bigger, try and... That's the thing, it's kind of awkward, right? Because he doesn't have a lot of the strong one pair hands. Right. I don't think he has any of the strong one pair hands. Does he bet small? It's definitely a bit awkward, because like you're saying, it's hard for him to have too many ace hands. I like it, he did go small. Oh, a very cheeky bet, about a fifth pot here. Because this is a bet. Uh, obviously, now the one drawback is, of course, he can get bluffed in this spot. But I like this. this he does have some Queen X here. Yeah. May even bet like, this with some Jack X, like a little block bet. This is a really awkward spot for Pascal, too. Ah, he does. Oh. This is the thing. Pascal moves it in. This is the one problem with that bet is you can get bluffed. Well, not much room to maneuver with seven high when you get shoved on. That is painful, especially when you turn the combo draw and it doesn't work out. Ultimately, the, the biggest question that I want to ask on this river is, should Felipe be going for it? Even the small sizing, big sizing, whatever, should he go for it at all? Is this a good story? Can he bluff here effectively? I mean, it's not a great story. There's not too much value that's obvious. The, the most obvious hand, I guess, is Queen Jack for value. Um, although he's betting so small, it doesn't really look like that. It looks like he's betting a Jack exactly for value. Right. And like, I don't know. It doesn't seem great to me. It doesn't seem like I, I like that he's betting so small that he actually does convince an eight that it's not good. That's kind of cool. But we're also putting a target on our back a little bit because the rate, the story is not great. We don't have very, and we, the sizing as well, like we just don't have very many strong hands here at all. We can easily get bluffed off this hand. We don't have a range advantage. It's not good. I understand right. trying to go for it, but it's not good. I think what Felipe was thinking is, okay, I want to take a shot because I have seven high. What is the most convincing shot I can take? I guess my range is so weak here that I should bet small because I'm trying to say like I have ace four and I'm getting, I'm trying to get called by King queen or something like that. I'm trying to like tell that yeah. story. The problem with that story is that if it is believed as you see, Pascal did believe it, 
well, you're going to get shoved on because the Pascal's going to put it together. He's going to be like, I have nine, 10, you don't. I have King 10, you don't. Like, how can you be betting? And oh, by the way, you're betting tiny. So you're saying you don't have that good of a hand. I guess you can't qualify shove. So GG, buddy. Like, what are you going to do? Yeah, I mean, Pascal actually blocks King 10, which may play into it a little bit as well. Blocking the nuts is always sure. nice. Pascal has those strong hands, like you were saying. He also has pocket queens, for sure. sure. He's got queen jack as well. Sure. He might have queen eight, which Felipe really can't have. So maybe queen eight at clubs exactly, I guess. But that's it for Felipe. Well, Pascal can have all the queen eights. Um, Pascal just has a clear range advantage. He blocks the nuts. The, ti- the bed is tiny and feels weak. It's a great time to move in, especially when you're, you're the chip leader. And if you're wrong, it's okay. But yep. and you're putting this guy's life on the line, this guy who's never at, up to this point won anything significant money-wise. It's a great time to race. So I think what happened here is Felipe actually did a convincing job telling the story he was trying to tell. But Pascal reacted correctly to that story with his hand, even though he could have won by just calling. If the story that Felipe is telling is true, this movement is going to work almost all the time with Mark McDonald sitting over there with 129K and ready to blow up at any time because he is Mark McDonald. This is going to work so frequently. I think this is a great move in by Pascal. I don't think that should be overlooked. I also think Felipe, while it's tempting to go for it when you have very near the bottom of your range, it's also okay just to give up sometimes. We lost two and a half blinds in this pot. The story is not great. I'm at a massive range disadvantage. Let's just move on to the next one and, and throw this one in the garbage, you know? Yeah, I mean, this also points to me, um, when we look at sort of the tree and how, how this thing plays out, going back to the flop, deciding to check call sets up a spot where it's really hard to get to bluff or get value later on, which sort of sucks, right? By check calling, if we like see what the board is and see the story that we can tell or not tell. So a bunch of stuff here that is... I don't know if we call it standard or not standard. This is just spots that like when we get into the final table of tournaments and and you're short, which is something that's going to happen a lot. All these marginal decisions are so important. And as we see here, Felipe, who, by the way, ends up winning this tournament. So he gets the 1.5 million, but he's making decisions that we think are are not ultimately optimal. And so and they really don't work out in this hand because Pascal punishes him deeply. Do you agree with us, though? Do you think that this should be a check call or do you like a check raise on the flop? Some people would actually argue, I think, for a shove pre-flop, by the way, which can't be that bad. But when it's only one blind, we kind of like just calling. Um, Also on the river, do you think Felipe should be betting at all? And what do you think about his sizing? Do you like the size he chose, which was really small, to just try and fold out a few things, the weaker parts of Pascal's range? Or do you like a bigger sizing where it's harder than to bully it the way Pascal ultimately did? Yeah, let us know in the comments. And by the way, if you like our analysis in this video, that is just the tip of the analytical iceberg, the top 10% of the analytical iceberg. You got to go to our podcast, the Breakdown Poker Podcast presented by the Poker Guys. You can find it anywhere you find podcasts pretty much. And that is where we really come up with our ideas. We had what I thought were pretty fascinating discussions about the flop, turn, and river in this hand, where we really develop these ideas, go in depth into all of the reasons for our ultimate conclusions that we presented in this video. If you like deeper analysis, a little more humor, a little more fun, you get that, gotta check out the podcast.